So, welcome back. Cultural heritage forms a front line in ongoing conflicts and has done so in numerous wars and disputes through history. The following three speakers will all highlight threats to culture and cultural heritage from different aspects in the event of conflict. First up is a speaker with more than 15 years of experience of working at the intersection between academic research and policymakers in states and international organizations. He will, in his speech, give us a better understanding of the changing role of cultural heritage in conflicts from a global perspective. Please give a warm welcome to the director for Nordic Center for Cultural Heritage and Armed Conflict, Friedrich Rosen. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so much. And uh, thanks so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me today and uh, also congratulations to the, to the ministers and uh, Nordic Baltic countries for uh, having this important declaration uh, which supports the international growing consensus that culture here it is, is also a matter of uh, war and conflict. And uh, I will turn the style a little bit now. I will not be as eloquent uh, in my talk as Ms. Fatima will be. I will be more cold and factual, so I'll just warn you already now and I'll speak a bit faster in order to go all over all the very important facts that I want to convey with, uh, uh, with you all. So, I'm myself a political scientist with a background in international security and war studies and uh, I work for this, on this topic for more than a, a decade now. And uh, among other things, I directed two larger NATO projects on the topic which aimed at supported, supporting allied nations with uh, crafting a NATO approach to uh, the heritage issue. And uh, the Nordic Center is basically a research and coordination hub flowing from those activities. Let me see how this works. Uh, and uh, I'll get a... So, here's a picture from the conference we organized last year in uh, NATO's headquarter in Brussels. Uh, in collaboration with the Office of the NATO Secretary General's uh, desk, just to get an impression of where I speak from and to emphasize that leading international processes related to the Ministry Declaration actually come with a solid Nordic footprint. And I've been asked to provide us with an overall narrative for the Declaration and our discussions here today. And to do that, I've decided to share with you one of my main concerns, and that is that the EU Atlantic community, including us up here in the north, really lag behind authoritarian regimes such as Russia when it comes to thinking about cultural heritage as a security issue. And I hope that my talk will convey a solid argument for stepping up our work in this area. So the question that I will hang my talk on is, how come that the Russian security outlooks includes a very strong perspective on cultural heritage while we still consider it a cultural sector issue that is mostly deemed irrelevant for defense and security. And my suggestion is that the answer to this question has to do with the difference in how we view cultural heritage. It's about mindsets. And my point is that the Euro-Atlantic countries up here, we subscribe to a backward-looking and apolitical idea of cultural heritage that emphasizes authenticity, intrinsic value, protection and conservation, while Russia maintains a forward-looking and much more ideological conception of heritage as a political tool that is closely connected to the national security objectives. So let me illustrate this difference in mindset between us and them by comparing national security strategies. National security strategies are generally thought of as high-level government documents that identify main national security issues, and in that way, they also form a basis for establishing military outlooks. And a first thing to notice is that 
post-Soviet Russian national security strategies, they contain increasingly large sections on cultural heritage and culture broadly viewed. Boris Yeltsin, 1997 National Security Concepts, it speaks about the propagandization of the national cultural heritage and Putin's first strategic document, the Russian National Security Concept from 2000, speaks about the cultural heritage of all Russia's people and the protection of traditional Russian spiritual and moral values, culture and historical memory. The 2009 and 2015 Russian national security strategies, they both mention unlawful infringement against cultural objects as part of a main threat to national security. And the most recent strategy from 2021 speaks about the preservation of the material and immaterial cultural heritage of the Russian people. The strategy emphasizes that, quote, the protection of traditional Russian spiritual and moral values Culture and historical memory is carried out in order to strengthen the unity of the peoples of the Russian Federation on the basis of an all Russian civic identity. End of quote. And the section on culture in the 2015 strategy emphasized the need to counter external cultural and informational expansion, including low quality mass culture and attempts, ironically, to falsify history. But in 2021, these issues occupy a much larger place, almost four pages. So, the 2021 Russian strategy reflects a growing Russian focus on culture and cultural heritage as key elements of its strategic environment. Traditional values, culture and historical memory, memory is clearly one of the top national security priorities in the Russian Federation. Russian authorities are clearly aware that the cultural sphere forms a separate battleground. And even if the 2021 Russian strategy has a more inward-looking focus than previous doctrines, it still draws some lines within policymakers' roadmaps, also when it comes to military outlooks. And then we have the so-called Russian humanitarian policy from 2022, which is like a full-form policy concept for cultural heritage and culture strangely connected to humanitarian cooperation, a concept usually denoting work focused on relief and human security. Now, as a stark contrast, the only culture that the United States 2022 national security strategy speaks about is agriculture. <laughs> and the same applies to all other recent US national security strategies we do find cultural heritage mentioned in U.S. national disaster management documents, but they do not, as Russians, link cultural heritage in the same dramatic manner to national security objectives and the survival of the nation. So, my suggestion is that the Russian and the U.S. security strategies present us with two very different templates for establishing military outlooks and security outlooks more broadly on cultural heritage. It's on the Russian outlook from the high strategic level, and in the case of the US, it's not really. And as I see it, the US version applies to most other NATO countries. Russia looks at politics and security. We look at protection and preservation. So, let's take a glimpse on the national security strategies of some of our NATO allies. The UK 2010 National Security Strategy briefly mentions cultural assets and cultural authority as levels for British aspirations. And the 2015 UK Defence and Security Review mentions the use of cultural dialogues and British culture in diplomacy and trade. Italy does not have a national security strategy in the strict sense of the word, but a collection of strategic documents. And considering Italy's very, at, very active attitude when it comes to promoting heritage in international fora. It's surprising to see that key Italian strategic documents contain no mentioning of cultural heritage. The 2022 French National Security Review briefly mentions culture among other disputed spheres, 
like sporting, linguistics, and diplomacy. Heritage and national identity is not described as a stand-alone topic that warrants consideration as a national security issue. Then we have Poland's 22 national security strategy, and that kind of stands out with wording that echoes the Russian concept. But this is the only strategy across Europe that I have found that does this. And on the European level, the 2009 European security strategy speaks about cultural ties, relations, and dialogue, but not European culture or cultural heritage as a security issue. The 2016 global strategy for the European Union, foreign the European Union's foreign and security policy, it also leaves out culture and cultural heritage, but it does mention culture as an inroad to counter violent extremism. In 2021, the EU's Foreign Affairs Council adopted an EU strategic approach to cultural heritage in conflict and crisis, quote, adding cultural heritage to the EU's foreign policy toolbox and providing a new political and operational framework on cultural heritage for peace, end of quote. The European Council emphasized that, quote, cultural heritage can be instrumentalized as a trigger for and target in conflict. The conclusion called for the protection and safeguarding of cultural heritage during periods of conflict and crisis. And then we have NATO, who does not yet have a policy in cultural heritage, but primarily addresses the issue under the law of armed conflict portfolio. And despite all the good work that has happened in that context over the years, we still see a skepticism across many of NATO's political representations towards connecting any broader concept of cultural property or heritage to NATO's security agendas. So, at the level of key strategic document, we can observe very clearly a major difference between Russia and NATO countries with regard to their respective conceptions of culture and cultural heritage. We do not really consider culture and cultural heritage as a security domain. And when we do, we look at international humanitarian law and protection, while Russia looks at politics and security. And to deepen that contrast a bit, it can be mentioned that the policies of cultural heritage was a major intellectual theme in the Soviet Union from the very beginning. The Cultural Revolution recognized the nature of cultural heritage and its importance for the survival of the Soviet Union. And during the Cold War years, Soviet experts maintained the understanding of heritage as an issue of international security, and they criticized UNESCO for neglecting cultures, social, and political dimensions. And Putin's 2014 New State Culture Policy merely continues this line of thinking by not assigning any intrinsic value to cultural heritage, only an instrumental role in the work with forming a Russian national mentality. And in practice, Russia has been very active when it comes to heritage in conflict. Here's a Russian symphonic orchestra celebrating the Russia-supported liberation of Palmyra in Syria in 2016, a strange but powerful media event. Here's Russian peacekeepers guarding an Armenian monastery in nagorno karabakh in 2020. And here's Crimea, where Russia, from the start of their aggression, misappropriated and manipulated cultural heritage to establish domination. And since the start of the 2022 20, aggression uh, against Ukraine uh, as, a, as a nation, cultural heritage has suffered immensely from the fighting. And there is generally agreement that Russia targets Ukrainian cultural heritage as part of the effort to destroy Ukraine as a nation. So, I believe that we can confidently conclude that the Russians, they have been quite good in looking at heritage through the security lens at home and abroad. While NATO countries, we have focused more on UNESCO concepts of protection and preservation. For Russia, cultural heritage remains a security and defense issue. For us, it's a cultural sector issue. 
2022 and not uh, 23, uh, three major book anthologies came out that focused on culture, heritage and armed conflict. And why the weaponization of culture, heritage is a frequent topic across the books, none of the chapters address the Russian perspective on culture, heritage. And this absence, it merely echoes how Russian heritage conception have been neglected by the academic literature. And our lack of understanding puts us in a disadvantaged position in the cultural domain when it comes to responding more generally to autocratic regimes that have a different view on what we call cultural heritage. And I think that this really provides the Nordic and Baltic countries with a very strong argument for scaling up work in this area. I think it provides a very strong argument for engaging defense and security sectors as well. Because it's not only about protection as defined by the 54 Hague Convention. It's about using culture heritage for information warfare and creating disruptive events and security dilemmas. And it's about a larger battle about history and historical narratives and claims about land ownership and the legitimization of violence, mass atrocities and destructions as we see in Ukraine. And this is why the Nordic Baltic Ministerial Declaration is so important because it offers an opportunity to work together and get up to speed with this agenda by crafting a Nordic Baltic approach. And it also offers an opportunity to craft this approach into a foreign policy framework, including our NATO collaboration. Because as the North Atlantic Treaty Act emphasizes, cultural heritage is a core NATO value. And I'll end my talk with this image of the Russian spiritual and cultural center in Paris, a 5,000 square meters complex that was opened in 2015, 600 meters from the Eiffel Tower, at the same time as Russia was attacking a European country. Thank you. Thank you, Friedrich, for this presentation. Um, I was wondering, in what way could cultural heritage be better integrated in uh, Western security doctrines? And doing so, is there a risk that the cultural heritage, uh, more specific, can become a military target if we do so? I think that what we are facing in, in, in the Nordics and, uh, and, and uh, EU Atlantic countries more uh, generally, and that is what I, 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 I try to hammer through in my paper here, is uh, um, a sexual divide between cultural sectors and, and security and defense sectors that really prevents the kind of collaboration that I would like to see. Mm. And, and, and that we are starting also to invest funding to build capabilities in, um, in, in sectors, uh, organizations, uh, research environments that are working with peace and security. Because it also works, uh, I mean, in that way that if you have, you know, policy frameworks that recognize, recognizes an area as a peace and security issue, you will see research environments picking up on this, and we'll see funding start flowing. And because we don't have that, we have a very you know, sharp sexual divide that uh, I think put us really in a disadvantage encountering um, um, the kind of aggression that we are facing uh, from our eastern flanks at the moment. Mm, interesting. Mm. Thank you very much, mm. Frederick, for your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat>